So we have um, about 40 minutes for discussion. I would like to keep the last five minutes to give the five speakers a minute each to tell us what is the most important thing, most important lesson they're taking from this seminar, uh, particularly with encouraging them to think about Africa-wide implications. Um, I would like to try and keep the early part of the discussion on Ghana itself and then take questions a little later about the Africa-wide implications, because this is a book basically about Ghana, so we should do it justice. Um, let us take questions. We'll take three at a time, um, then we'll give the panelists a chance to respond. And I'll take two from the room and one from online in each round. Would that be fair? We have a lot of people online, I understand, far more than us lot. Okay, um, gentlemen over there and the lady over here. Um, my name is William Akiwumi. I'm an agricultural advisor with USAID, the Africa Bureau. Um, originally from Ghana, so you know, welcome to <laughs> to my friend here. Uh, one question that I have is, you know, I didn't really see a whole lot of discussion about the, the impact of infrastructure, uh, including roads and power, on on agricultural transformation. Uh, what is the current status, and and how is that being addressed, you know, if if at all, to to boost agricultural productivity? Thank you. Hi, uh, Ann Tutwiler. I, um, hey Peter, um, hair is much longer now. Um, I have just uh, been asked to lead a newly formed coalition of countries who are, uh, have signed up to be willing to repurpose and reinvest their agricultural subsidies uh, to address climate change, environment, nutrition, and of course productivity issues. And Ghana is one of the countries that has signed up to this coalition uh, with support from the World Bank um, and uh, CG System and, and many others. So this book is incredibly useful um, to, to start thinking about what, uh, what Ghana should be focusing on. But I guess I had two questions. One is um, how do com to communicate the results of this, how do you plan to communicate the results of this book? to the Ghanaian officials uh, and other stakeholders in the country who um, will need to understand you know, what's been presented. And then the second question, um, because our coalition is not just looking at productivity, but it's also looking at the environmental issues. Uh, Sashi, I believe you mentioned uh, the issues around uh, the challenges of expanding land area and soil degradation. Um, and uh, I think Simeon just mentioned that climate change was not part of the study. So how do you see incorporating some of the cha environmental and climate challenges that Ghana faces based on what you've uh, seen in the book? Thanks. We have an online question. This one is uh, from Mahama from the University of Debris in Hung Hungary. What has accounted for the over-dependence of Ghanaian import of rice, even though it's a potential country that could produce more than enough rice? Okay, we have three questions. One about infrastructure. Is there any chance that Sam Benin, who wrote the public uh, investment chapter, is available online? No? Then I guess probably direct that one to Shashi. And then the question um, about communication plans for the book within Ghana. Um, Shashi, uh, Danielle, you'll do that one? Or do we go to Rajul, head of communications? <laughs> anyway, um, and then Rice. Uh, and I'm going to throw that one to Edward. <laughs> I think on the returns to infrastructure, there's only one study that we did, which is not directly on infrastructure, but really impact of introduction of three-wheelers, which could go uh, 
which could be operated on, on, on roads on which no other vehicles could operate. So you could really look at it as a way of improving, improving roads. And that showed tremendous, really, benefits in terms of uh, reduction of time uh, taken to, uh, you know, bring produce to the household. I mean, uh, when we talk about roads, and in particularly in the Ghanaian context, what's more important is not roads between villages, but what they call farm tracks between the farms and the villages, because ultimately you have to carry everything on the on the head. If you produce more, you need to carry more on the head. And that itself offers us a decent center. So that is the only study that we have done, and that showed positive benefits, not only in agriculture, but it helped you know, being able to access to hospitals uh, and so forth. That's only one, all right? Yeah, actually, we, we didn't get a chance to talk about these two type of uh, investment. So investment in infrastructure, in education, in health, in the, the capability issue is pretty much belong to Danny Rogers defined as the fundamentals. So Ghana actually has done pretty well in this part. But that, that, that doesn't mean that you can automatically lead to agriculture productivity growth. Think about you have a nice road, but you don't have other conditions, they may jump to whatever this uh, tractor and the transportation to go to close by urban town and uh, to do down farm business. So basically to have agriculture productive growth, I, we feel at least for Ghana's case, the binding country is not infrastructure at this moment. Yeah, um, hello, yeah. on the issue of um, Rice, I think um, it is the quintessential problem that Ghana faces and many other African faces. It's a political economy issue. If you look at those who are importing rice in Ghana and you go behind the veneer of the trader who is importing rice, there is normally some very important political actor, either within the current party linked to all kinds of things. That's one. And the second is also that the kinds of policies that governments are promoting to support rice production are more populist. And they are not necessarily anchored in supporting the private sector to develop. So the government d develops capacity to actually administer fertilizers through its, its own network of vested interests and so on. So, and you can take this and look at all the other products. And the, the, the book is ma making a proposal that emphasis should be placed on non-traditional exports, which is fine, but it would quickly be taken over by vested interest if the strategic policy direction is not geared to looking at the market forces and how you can strengthen private sector to really take that responsibility. The tendency is for the government to set up an outfit to distribute you know, the particular commodity, inputs, and so on. Um, for example, if you look at the issue of middlemen, middlemen have always been demonized. But when you look at what they're doing, they're doing tremendous service to the traders, I mean, to the farmers, because they are very entrepreneurial. They even finance the, the farmers on short-term basis to be able to get their products in. But at the same time, you would see that the government is setting up parallel institutions to directly support farmers, which is very populist because that's the only way they can get the visibility within the communities that they're supporting them. So the rice issue is very much replicated with any of the other commodities. In fact, you would ask, why is it that Ghana imports tilapia from China? You know, when there are so many tilapia farms, the rivers are burgeoning with tilapia. Why is it happening? And the answer lies in who are behind the importation of this commodity. So there is a regulatory capture, state capture, which continues to permeate from government to government. Because all the governments, the two parties, have vested interests, short-term horizon, in terms of how they deal with these issues. And I think that is the challenge that we face. How do you break that cycle? 
how do you begin to have policies that are consistent and long term? You know, it's a big elephant in the room. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Um, you want to talk about communication? Yeah, just briefly. Uh, we've got a multi pronged communication strategy. We've already posted um, uh, kind of a, a blog into Ghanaian news sources that was done a few weeks ago. Um, we have um, this brief uh, synopsis was shared with, uh, should have been shared with over 100 different. Um, uh, individuals who've been accumulated on our listserv for the, our Ghana Strategy Support Office, so targeted mailing, and then also an even smaller group were sent actually the book. We will hope to do an actual seminar uh, in Accra, but it will be quite small at our office in Accra. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the government would be um, uh, open to, to attending, but I think thus far there's been some resistance uh, by the ministry. Yeah, I haven't forgotten. We may come back to you and ask for ideas about communications in Ghana. Um, the climate and change and environmental issues, I, I think we'll have to realize in a book like this that it's a bit backward looking. The research for this began five, six years ago, and well, now the issues change. Oh, I'm just not talking into it. Sorry. So this is a book that's based on past research, and I'm sure if we in Ghana is looking forward to the uh, working on these more forward-looking issues but uh, building resilience to climate change is fine but you still got to deal with the underlying structural economic problems otherwise you're just going to have poor people who are resilient but they're still going to be poor you've got to get them out of poverty and resilience so these priorities from the book I think are still fundamental um, does anyone want to talk more specifically about environment, climate change, or is that that's the next book we're all you're all going to write? You do. Yeah, yeah that's your baby. Yeah, no, I I would like to uh, <laughs> address it. I I agree that uh, the research is look is um, building on what uh, the work that was done some five six years ago, and so that's correct. However, it's being written now, and then you have a concluding chapter. And the concrete chapter should look into the future. And that's where the, uh, the, the topic of climate becomes quite important. Uh, but Peter, is, I think you are right when you say, uh, yes, you need to get the fundamental rights, and then if you make them resilient, then in, you, know, you, need, you can still have, have poor people. The question, I, I don't think that's the, I mean, I wouldn't pose that question that way because they are being affected now. The climate is actually pushing them more in poverty now than, you know, without climate change. That's the issue. So um, when we talked about the fundamental, the fundamental should also include, you know, how to actually adapt to the impact of climate. So I'll give you an example. We at the World Bank, we financed through the West Africa agricultural productivity program in Senegal, which is um, a regional center for dry cereal. We supported a regional research center with the CGIA research that led to the development of uh, cereal, like uh, um, 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 two, two, two sorghum and millet that are uh, climate resilient, very much uh, resistant to heat that are early maturing and that are fetching a very good price. Three things in one. And that is the kind of thing that we need to be able to support because it's getting people out of poverty today. And for me, there's a, there's, there's a uh, if you want, uh, uh, you will be, we'll be addressing the, the fundamental issues there while at the same time we're addressing the climate issue. So. Uh, I don't think we need to push it f to the future. We need to address it now. Yeah, just not to sell the book short, there is a <laughs> chapter about agricultural change from a village, the village perspective, and that's based on household and village interviews, looking at change over three decades in, the, in, in four villages. 
and there is some very rich evidence in there about how farmers have been adjusting their cropping patterns. They've adopted uh, different varieties, they've changed their planting dates and so on in response to, to climate change. So there is some rich micro evidence in the book. You should still buy the book even if it <laughs> still needs another chapter. Um, okay, let's take another round of questions. Yeah, what, what's that mean? Oh, you're, you're, <laughs> you got two fingers. You only have one question. <laughs> and then Frank. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask a question about reviving some long-standing infrastructure. Uh, along the coast, north of Accra, maybe 500 kilometers, there are railways that the British built and when they were assembling their aircraft to fight the North African war that was going on. What about revitalization of those and using those to create a railway from the coastline, the entire coastline of Ghana, and passing through Accra? That could ease uh, most of these agricultural into urbanization areas. Do you have any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, Hi, yes. Uh, <clears throat> can you, uh, my name is Frank Place, uh, Director of the Policies Institute and the Markets Program here at IFPRI. So my question is about the policy and investment landscape in Ghana. So given under the context of devolution, I was curious as to whether, A, um, local political leaders can actually have influence on agricultural policies and investments at the national level, wh whether they can influence that, given the different contexts, you know, the, the north and the south and the central are all so different in agriculture. And then the second question is, w within the, in the scope that uh, local uh, leaders have um, some funds to invest in, how are, are, how, to what extent are they prioritized, prioritizing agriculture over other kinds of uh, sectors like education and health and so, so on? And then one more online. Thank you, Peter. Suresh Babu from IFPRI. Um, we talk about political commitment all the time. It looks like there is political commitment, but in wrong place uh, uh, from what Edward is saying. Um, we also talk about public sector capacity, and you bring that out nicely in, in, the, in the book. And we also talk about the coordination. And all three are very important at the policy process level. And I'm wondering how um, is it coming together in terms of translational opportunities for converting evidence, either coming from ASET or from IFPRI, uh, into action on the ground? How are we advising using this translational capacity? And what is missing right now to change the, the way in which we make the policies? Yes, um, this one is Daniel from the African Agricultural Technology Foundation in Nairobi. To what extent have input subsidies, especially on productivity enhancing technologies, played a role in the Ghanaian agricultural transformation, and what can we borrow for the rest of Africa? Okay, um, these questions get tougher. Um, <laughs> Who would like to take the railway one? The railway one. Yeah, that's a local question. <laughs> it's a local question. Yeah, I, I think um, <clears throat> clearly um, the railway um, sector has been one of the neglected sectors over the last several decades. But this government has taken a very much uh, daring approach. They are currently revitalizing the railway system, the, exi the old system, which is a triangle from Accra to Kumasi and then to Takradi port and all that. That is being done. But they also have plans. And in fact, that there are investments now being mobilized, financing, pop private financing being mobilized to finance the railway from uh, Kumasi right down to the north. So that, that there is clearly, in fact, there is a minister for railways in this government. So it shows the strong emphasis and the recognition that railways is going to be one of the drivers of transformation in, in Ghana, and they're trying to do that. So I think there is hope there. The question, though, 
is whether or not if this regime, you know, I mean, if a new regime comes, which is not the same party, whether they would continue that path is another issue. But I think it's such a visible, uh, and it's populist, but really grounded in economic fundamentals that no government would dare stop that process. That's my view, but I, I hope um, it works out that way. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions on the role of local policy makers and participatory processes. I think, Danielle, sure. you're jumping at that. I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so Frank's question about um, the role of local leaders on the national context and then prioritizing ag over other sectoral investments. Um, so on the latter question, um, from work we've done, um, not necessarily. Uh, we've seen, looking at the district budget spending, we've actually seen um, spending disproportionately going to public works <laughs> programs. Um, and th there is a kind of local budgeting process that goes on in the district assemblies. And so with devolution, ag uh, departments are now part of the assemblies, um, and so they can't rely necessarily on line ministry directives. Uh, they're negotiating with their colleagues from education, health, et cetera. Um, so they're, it's created kind of a new political economy at the local level. Um, then secondly, um, this is a challenge I think that's happening in a lot of countries where you do have a trend towards devolution or some form of decentralization. And at least in Ghana, the assemblies can make their own development plans. Um, now, how does that translate into national development plans is, is not clear. Um, and I think there is that dichotomy. You have these CADAP initiatives that engage with heads of state, you know, at the national level, um, but you have this parallel process going on at the subnational level. We see it in, in Kenya as well, where they have a pretty extreme um, devolution process. Um, and then I guess the translational capacity question from Suresh. Um, if I take what you're saying is how we, with these kind of more governance or political economy issues, how do we get that into the policy process to change? And actually, we have capacity in Ghana. Sure, sure. Ghana. Yeah. And why is it not connected to policy making system? Seems like Edward wants to take this. <laughs> I mean, two things. Um, the first one on, um, I mean, you were, you were just referring to issues relating to um, the investments in agriculture vis-a-vis -vis in the other sectors. And when you look at the local level, I think one of the structural constraints which continues to persist is the fact that the district heads, the municipality heads and district heads are still appointed by the president. And therefore, it still drives the party direction. And until that is done, there is a constitutional reform that is ongoing and I think Parliament would soon be voting to have the district assembly heads and the municipal assembly heads to be you know elected and I think once that is done it would give greater flexibility and, and authority to the districts to be able to manage their own development affairs so I think that's one I mean opportunity that is emerging and I agree with you that it's, you know, I don't think there is a, capa it's, it's a capacity issue. It's a capability issue, which is different from capacity. And the capability lies in the fact that the government's own strategic policy agenda are focused on basically, you know, feeding the party line. And therefore, they are not keen on even moving on on providing the enabling support for the public sector to operate. I mean, this government has 112 ministers, okay? This perhaps is the highest in the world. But the answer given for why they're 112 is that the public sector is weak, we don't trust them. But until you begin to use the public sector, you will not be able to you know, move on these issues. So you have this layer and once this government goes, another group comes. So you start with the same musical chairs constantly going on and on. I think that's the challenge. It's still embedded in the political economy, you know, of vested interest and in trying to promote party lines, populist strategies, and so on. They may be structural, but the way it's implemented is that it's direct so that the party is visible 
at the local level, as opposed to promoting private sector initiatives and strengthening institutional structures at the base to ensure that these issues can be addressed. I think that's the real challenge. Sorry, you want to say something? You want to talk to that? Can I take one minute? Um, we've invested a lot into really making the local research capacity relevant for policy making. We invested in how to make the PhD thesis and master's thesis address some of the local issues and so on. But the local researchers often tell you the government listen to outsiders more than the locals. It doesn't mean anything. But on the other hand, I mean, that's not fully right. On the other hand, a lot of local researchers work as consultants in designing programs and other kinds of things. So in a way, they do have more influence than they realize. And then ultimately, there is a limit to all of this uh, by what Ed has said, who is listening? Uh, uh, because the policymakers, just like Trump, uh, who want populist policies, they know what they want to do. Nobody is listening. That leaves the question about the role of input subsidies. We've already heard that they've been used to help win elections, but have they played any productive role in the transformation story? Shahi, do you Shashi, you want um, the, the question in Ghana that we were trying to really answer is to what extent uh, fertilizer subsidy really adds to uh, demand for fertilizers. And that's really fairly hard to detect because in some areas everything may be subsidized. Uh, uh, but the most difficult are the uh, aspect of subsidies in Ghana that, 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 that affected agriculture is unpredictability. You know, because the government didn't really have the resources, subsidies are often uh, uh, given, handed out during the middle of the season. And since farmers expect subsidies, they do not apply, fertilizer do not come. And the private sector uh, fertilizer companies may, don't make decisions about supply because they, they haven't heard from the government. Uh, so that's, this has made it actually very difficult farmers and for research to really uh, kind of a find out, figure out whether subsidies are really making farmers use more fertilizer and to what extent they're obviously increasing productivity. But one of the things that uh, the qualitative information that, that we have is often fertilizer supplies are delayed. So whatever you are, fertilizers are applied, your returns to that are already low because of the reasons of soil fertility that I mentioned earlier and poor recommendations and so forth. If, if I may just quickly add, I think also it's, again, it goes to the, the strategy, the approach uh, that the government adopts. And we know that some farmers-based farmers, farmers -based organizations are doing great work, but the government is not necessarily supporting these types of organizations because they are much more effective in channeling resources to their own members. And again, I think this is where you know public investment and, and public support needs to be further strengthened. But it must be anchored in sound commercial principles, you know, that the market you know signals, the market failures are addressed, as opposed to direct government intervention. I think that's where, for example, the government delays in providing subsidies because they don't have the, they couldn't raise the, the, the funds immediately, or donors who may f finance it are not, are not forthcoming. Then, the timing of subsidies, I mean, um, fet I mean the, the fertilizers, are not aligned with when they needed it. And obviously what you find is that a lot of the subsidies find their way into the market, you know, at higher prices, you know. Thank you. Um, we have not much time left. Um, I'm going to open up if you want to ask a question about implications for Africa. That, that's okay now, but we'll also take any burning questions on Ghana. Who has an Africa question? Emmy? Uh, oh gosh, we got more than we can handle here. Uh, let's try you three. <laughs> 
Hi, Amy Simmons from CSIS and the Global Panel on Ag and Food Systems for Nutrition. And this has been a really interesting presentation, much more depressing than I expected, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I think that the one of the key messages, which is that the structure of the economy is not changing toward industrialization and manufacturing as rapidly as everyone expected, is really one of those key questions. And I. I think Ghana is not the only country that's experiencing this, and I think the infrastructure question kind of tried to hit on that. But you know, in our in the last go here, I would I'd really like to hear from you all as to where that leadership f and where the capital and where the governance that's going to support a the transformation to a greater industrial, a more productive and, and successful industrial sector, perhaps based upon agriculture, but perhaps based upon other things, um, where, that, where that might come from and how that's going to happen. My name is Eugene Terry. I, I used to work for CGI a long time ago. I chair an advisory panel uh, at the West African Center for Crop Improvement in Legon. And riding from the university to my hotel, there's a, a shocking manifestation of uh, unemployed youth in, in Accra. And I'm sure that that can be uh, duplicated in other parts of the continent. In our construct for this silent agri-food revolution, what role do we see for these very young, active, but underemployed talents and skills and, 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 and energies in uh, as bridging the gap, especially with urban urbanization, rapid urbanization, and the need to move towards uh, agricultural transformation. What role do we see? What policies are emerging? And what lessons can we learn from what is happening in, in Ghana? Um, my name is Johnson Ekwere. I'm a retired professor from the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Um, first, is the book available now? Can I get a copy? Two, um, I would like any of the speakers to expand a little bit because from the, 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 the handout which I got, I didn't get enough information. Could they please expand a little bit on the um, technology transfer and value chain as determinants for agricultural transformation in Ghana? And finally, how do we deal, how do they think we should deal with the implementation malfunctionings in our governments? Because that is where all of the problems that we've just enumerated rests. There is a lot, to my mind, uh, a lot of implementation imperfections. Uh, you've tried to allude to some of them, but I would like to hear more succinctly uh, some kind of uh, suggestions. Thank you. Uh, this one is from Yakubu from Nigeria. Should we also emphasize agricultural extension as rural farmers play vital roles in agricultural transformation? Okay, the clock keeps ticking away there. Um, we have two or three questions here related to governments. How do you get African governments out of the way, I think? <laughs> um, who would like to take those on? Let me, let me just talk about the manufacturing issue first, because I think uh, we have done quite a few, a bit of work in that area. Um, and when you look at the literature now, I mean, in fact, the Joe Stiglitz and others, Rodnick and others, have been arguing that most of African economies are going to shift from agriculture to services. And in fact, when you look at the Ghanaian structure, is very much aligned to that, although the service sector um, is still 
very much low productivity sector. Okay, but technology is beginning to occur. D digital technologies are beginning to change the pattern with gig economy growing. But the, the other issue about manufacturing is that I don't think we should think of manufacturing as creating jobs, just as it did in Asia. It's not going to happen. Because already the employment in manufacturing in Africa has been declining. And this is partly related to, to the fact that digital technologies are also substituting for labor. And it's beginning to show in Africa. Although the cost of these technologies are still high in Africa, but it's beginning to show. And there's also reshoring of, of some of these manufacturing back to the developed countries where there is customized services being provided and so on. Um, so manufacturing is still important, particularly in agro-processing and a number of other components, component assembly and so on. Where agro-processing, of course, the employment elasticity is still high, and therefore you'll be able to create some jobs, but, that, but not that much. As technology begins to invade that sector, it will also begin to reduce the amount of labor there. But the issue is not so much labor force increase in employment creation there. It's increasing productivity that would have the ripple effect on the broader economy that we need to focus on. So manufacturing still needs to be pushed. But that requires a concerted effort by governments where they are not picking winners, but they are trying to lift all boats providing deepening the financial mediation to ensure that small and medium enterprises can begin to thrive. And using FDI as a way of linking to small and medium enterprises in the country. But there has to be a deliberate, systematic effort, as Ethiopia is doing. In fact, just last week, we had uh, the, the, the Minister for Private Sector Development in Ethiopia, Akebe, who has been spearheading the industrial policy in Accra to give a lecture on how you know, the manufacturing sector is, is evolving in Ethiopia. Very, very interesting. But of course, the underlying dynamics are very different in Ethiopia compared to Ghana. So you, you, know, you have to be very circumspect about that. Now, on the issue, yeah, on the, yeah. OK. I think on the, on the issue, well, I've, I've, I've touched on the technology issue. Um, and also, you, you mentioned the issue of employment of youth you know, in the, in the, you know, food, the silent, you know, um, I mean, food industry which is emerging. I think there are options, there are possibilities there, and digital technology is also going to help. And we can see that a lot of youth are moving into this area in the gig economy. We are currently doing a six-country study on youth employment and skills to first of all document the state of the knowledge and the situation in the countries, but also to look at how um, the private sector is, is taking advantage of digitization and what the role of the state in doing that. So I think there's a lot to be learned in that area, but the jury is very much out. The challenges are quite enormous in that area. Okay, thank you. Um, we really are running out of time. Um, I will answer one question. The book is available free to anybody in digital form online. And if you've come all the way from Nigeria, I'm sure Ifpri will give you a hard copy. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, let's wrap up. I'm one minute each just to tell you, to say what is the most important message from this book for Ghana or Africa. Simeon. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Peter. No, uh, for me, uh, one important message from the book is uh, to, to really to deepen the reforms that needed to really attract the private sector and to transform agriculture, and especially create employment and job for the youth. And I think uh, it is something, if it's quite, if it's done uh, in terms of uh, really um, doing the reforms, it will be, it will go a long way to have an impact on not only the transformation, but the creating a you know, job in high paying, uh, you know, with high paying uh, wages. For example, Daniel showed the the data on the EBA, EBA is the enabling the business of agriculture. I was actually struck to see that Ghana is among the, the low ranking countries in Africa. And if, we, if, if, if the country ranks low on some of the key sectors like fertilizer, uh, you know, and um, issues of uh, access to uh, inputs and so on like that, 
there's no way you can transform your agriculture. The private sector will not come in, no job will come in, and unemployment will continue, just to pick on the question that uh, Eugene uh, raised earlier. So deep in reforms, uh, legal and regulatory reforms, improve the business of agriculture, attract the private sector to invest, and you will create the job needed. Yeah, actually, we, we didn't get time to talk about more about um, as a comparison between uh, Ghana and Africa. Actually, I prepared the slides and eventually I drop it because of the time. So I think um, we, we like uh, the lady said, we kind of feel depressing uh, after, even after we wrote the book. But one thing I think we, we know very little about this informal sector. We kind of, kind of put them all together as a low productivity sector. So we actually, we, we have to look at into this sector to see the potential for some firms, some small, medium uh, enterprises. They may actually have, will play a much bigger role than we think about to, to get a China, uh, Chinese firm to come. So Africa countries maybe need to think about more how to have this kind of strategy to to make their local firm more productive. Okay, um, at the risk of incurring Peter's wrath for addressing some other points, um, I'm just going to say quickly there there is a book on youth em employment in Africa uh, actually coming out uh, November 5th. Um, so you can look forward to that and I think my neighbor here is the one who wrote the chapter on Ghana and youth, so <laughs> to be to be continued. Um, and just on the governance issues, um, you know, one option is always talk about uh, binding um, the constraints of governments so that they they have to be committed over time to different commitments. And in Ghana, they've been very committed to performance contracts with ministers. Um, but one thing is perhaps getting both parties to commit to certain performance indicators that they that they make quite public and transparent. And then you have to make those visible uh, reporting on progress each year, regardless of which party's in office. So kind of binding the hands of both parties, regardless who's in office. And my takeaway message, I think, I mean, like. I mean, I think this concept of transformation implies um, something, you know, something big and visible um, in my mind that you kind of wave a magic wand and you kind of have a makeover in a sense. Um, you, you've transformed, you've, you've changed drastically. And I think that does lead a propensity for African and, and other uh, governments to, to lean towards these more visible projects, um, whether they're large scale infrastructure projects or these subsidy projects and these more uh, non-visible um, investments, particularly in legislation, um, you know, hard, hard things to do that voters don't understand very well gets ignored and gets sidelined. Um, so I think it, you know it's really important that we, we make sure transformation is not just about a, kind of a visible visible shift, but is also addressing some of these underlying non-visible fundamentals. Yeah, I think to complement that, uh, I, I I believe that um, you know government expenditure, increasing public expenditure in agriculture is going to be key. But it has to be strategic, well targeted, and not to crowd out the private sector. It's very important. And secondly, the state needs to focus continuously on building the enabling infrastructure, roads in particular. Railway is going to be key for Africa, and I think that area needs a little bit more concerted effort at the regional level. The regional dimension needs to be taken into account in order to integrate the regional you know, markets to ensure that you have economies of scale. Manufacturing is not going to take off you know, with, with each country trying to do its own thing. You have to look at regional you know, um, in public goods, which would enable creating scale, which is important for manufacturing to take effect and compete in the global value chain. So that's what I have. Uh, although farmers haven't haven't kind of a practice intensive agriculture. I think the message here, uh, something that needs to pay attention to is how rational the farmers are, that how indeed they have responded to changes in their own need, the environment and market opportunities. 
at least in Ghana and I'm sure too in other, other countries, the feeling that farmers need to be taught to run their farming as a business is really pervasive and it's kind of an outrageous feeling and that has two consequences. One is investments in all these training programs. I mean, I heard about capacity development farmers only here. I think the rest of the world assumed that the farmers responded. And then we looked at how best we can offer them opportunities to respond. And, and, and quite a bit of the projects here really focus on how do we change their mind? They're not making their decisions properly. How do we improve them? That's one. And number two is we don't evaluate technologies as to does it make sense for farmers to adopt these technologies? There's near total simple analysis of what is the profitability of something that we are recommending? Absolutely do. And with the focus on value chain development, again, it's on institutions, I think which is the, 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 the focus on bid on technologies and are they good for farmers, are they going to adopt it, what is going to, you know, what it's going to take to get them to adopt, I think is really missing. And I think so we need to put our faith that farmers indeed will adapt what makes sense to them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Schultz won the Nobel Prize more than 50 years ago, in part for showing that peasants are economically rational and do the best they can with the resources available. It's incredible how 60 years later many people haven't read that book. Uh, <laughs> um, this has been a wonderful discussion and I'm sorry we can't go on. Um, those who would like to stay and talk to our speakers, um, they're not going anywhere. The book is available free, as I said. The price is right. It's a uh, digital form and you can get the link from somebody at IFBRI. Um, Thank you for all your stimulating questions. Will you please join me in thanking our panel? Thank